hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm very happy uh, to be here, finally, uh, live Scala conference. Um, I would like to start by giving you some rationale uh, behind the talk. So in our company, we are using Scala uh, to write backend services, mostly the HTTP layer. And in the process of writing those services, um, uh, we have come across some, so to say, standard industry tasks, process of writing uh, tasks uh, that uh, have to be expressed using uh, Cat's Effect and FS2. Uh, I have a theory that wherever your Cat's Effect code base gets large enough, your code automatically sucks in FS2 as a dependency. Uh, so in principle, we are looking for recipes for, I submit to you, some standard industry problems. Uh, but it took us quite a while to find the right solution, and uh, the path was not so obvious. Uh, and now, Cat's Effect is a beautifully designed library with, with, with building blocks that, that click together very nicely. Uh, but when you start off, it's not that straightforward and obvious how to use them. Uh, you could argue that you could add some batteries included into the libraries. There are some other libraries that which, which have more batteries included. Um, uh, but I, I would argue that um, in the long run, uh, it may hit you in the back, because sooner or later the happy path will no longer be enough, uh, and you will end up in the place where you um, don't know how to solve some problems because you, le because you miss uh, some fundamental uh, understanding of the internals of the effect systems library. Uh, some core principles that underpin the effect systems library in general. Um, so, uh, the uh, agenda looks as follows. Does it work? It doesn't. Oh, okay. It's, I'm sorry, it does not propagate properly. I have no idea what is happening. Sorry. Um. Yeah, I have presentation notes here, but they do not somehow. Uh, uh, no, it's okay. I will go without the clicker, but. Uh, Yeah, so let's see if this will work. And here I would like to have my notes. Okay, back in the game. Uh, so plan of the talk is the following. I will, I, I will um, ask for three recipes which are, in my opinion, standard industry problems. Then uh, I will uh, use those recipes as an excuse to div diverge into Cat's effects internals, mostly fibers, structured concurrency that we heard already uh, yesterday during Adam's talk, local state, uh, IO app and IO runtime. And in the end, uh, hopefully we will see some full-baked recipes using the supervisor dispatcher and IO local. And speaking about recipes, in fact, that's a recent addition to Cat's Effect web website, uh, and it's called recipes. So it looks that, uh, that developers are actually looking for them. Uh, it's a work in progress. You are very much encouraged to contribute. You can do it in two ways. Either you propose a recipe that you're missing, there is a PR for that, or write a recipe yourself. Before we get started, some, um, some, some wiring uh, for the code that will be mm, code snippets. There will be too, way too many code snippets, but uh, the silver lining is that they actually compile and run. So it's a sort of poor man's live coding session. Uh, I do not expect you to ingest all the code snippets, but, it's, but they're, they're for reference, if you want to look back at the slides. Okay, so let's formulate the task. The first task is a, a WebSocket client, and we would like to write a resource-safe imperative WebSocket client that would wrap some underlying uh, a WebSocket connection uh, that would provide us with some imperative API that would send the messages, and when we uh, get out of the scope of the WebSocket client, we would like to all the things to automatically to uh, gracefully shut down. So that's the 
That's the API, it's simple enough, exposes one method. Uh, that's the resource that would manage the, the life cycle of a WebSocket client. And we would use it like this, we would open a resource of a WebSocket client, we would send some messages, and hopefully when we are done, when we exit the, the resource scope, uh, all the underlying WebSocket connections would be closed. The second one is uh, pretty common, I believe. It's uh, translating an FS2, uh, translating a callback-based API uh, into an FS stream. So we've got some, some legacy callback-based API, and we want to mix it with the FX systems. Uh, and in our case, business case, the, the FS2 stream was actually a sending side of a WebSocket connection. We have some additional constraints we would like uh, to preserve the ordering of the messages, which was pretty important. And we also want to make it as lightweight as possible for the caller thread that is in actually invoking the callback. Uh, so the API is, that's, that's a proposition, uh, one method, uh, callback method, and in this method we would like to enqueue the message into an FS stream, preserve the message ordering, and uh, hopefully not congest the, the caller thread. The third one is uh, about logging. Uh, we would like to enrich our log messages with some additional contextual data. Uh, for example, we would like to add correlation ID to, uh, to our web, uh, to our HTTP server, and thread it through all the processing of the request. Uh, or we would add to add some business logic, like the user ID. So you could think about it a little bit like uh, tracing, but in logs. And uh, it was a it came to me as a surprise uh, that actually uh, the topic of logging is quite comprehensive and complex. Uh, these are alive Scala logging libraries which support contextual logging. So that's quite a lot. Uh, it looks that everybody sooner or later writes either a JSON uh, library or a Scala logging library. Uh, some of them are effectful, like log for cats, Odin, or Woof. Some of them are not. Uh, if you're interested, there is a recommended reading by the author of Blindsight, uh, a very nice uh, article, uh, I leave it here, about logging and, what, uh, and, and actually how logging, he argues that logging is actually better than tracing, because we as developers like logs, like sift to logs. Uh, okay, let's revise the three tasks. The first one is about managing a life cycle of a fiber running WebSocket connection in the background. Uh, but it's, it's a bit of a trick, it's, it's a tricky life cycle but, uh, because it's, it's a non-standard life cycle. It's not like uh, racing two effects. We would like to have it uh, bound to the, to the scope of, a, of, of, some ob of, some, of some instant of an object of a WebSocket client. Um, the second one is about how to safely and efficiently actually invoke I.O from within the unsafe code. So it's the opposite way around. Usually we wrap unsafe code into I.O. Now we have the unsafe callback-based API, and we want to run I.O.s from within this code. And the third one is how to propagate data across the fork fiber, because if you want to log correlation ID in the HTTP server, uh, we need to propagate this context across the fork fibers. Um, so fibers here, fibers here. Uh, uh, Fibers are everywhere in, in, in uh, effect system libraries. It's the core abstraction of, of cat's effect. Every effect that you, every IO that you run uh, is executed by some fibers. Uh, but how do they differ from threads? Uh, here's a quick comparison. It's by no means an, uh, a comprehensive one. Uh, but let's quickly go through it. Uh, as for availability and cost of creation, fibers are extremely cheap. They cost about 150 bytes. There is very little head on, on, on their creation. Threads, on the other hand, are quite costly to, to, to create. Um, they scale to a couple of thousands. There's a boundary of operating system threads, which they map to. Uh, fibers can scale to millions with no problems. Uh, this has some impact on performance, because if you think about modern, uh, modern applications, like an HTTP server, you have a request. Uh, in the old Java world, you would, you would uh, fork a thread to, to process the request and create a response. And uh, if you have high, high concurrence, you end up with many threads. And threads do not scale in Java. Uh, in fibers, um, on the other hand, the performance may actually increase 
if with the increased number of fibers, which is crazy, and it is thanks to some great work uh, on the work uh, um, stealing compute pool in the Cast Effect library, which is based on a uh, uh, scheduler uh, from Rust called Tokyo. It goes actually even worse for, for threads. Um, when you have concurrency, you have to switch the context uh, pretty often. And uh, it turns out that uh, context switching, uh, when, when the number of threads is, is, uh, is pretty big, is very expensive. Uh, according to some statistics, it accounts to about 30% uh, of the total runtime uh, because of the page faults, because threads are so heavyweight. Uh, and context switching is ubiquitous in, in uh, modern concurrent apps. Uh, so multitasking, fibers do it nicely through, through cooperative yield uh, threads, uh, uh, follow the preemptive, preemptive uh, OS level uh, brutal, um, brutal um, multitasking. Interruption is pretty non-existent, save interruption for threads. Um, uh, the sub operation has been deprecated. Uh, it's inherently unsafe to, to, to call thread interrupt. I think we all know that. Uh, thread, uh, fibers interrupt safely and, and efficiently. As for composability, uh, threads do not compose because there is no return type. Uh, so fibers, you've got the return types. And the beautiful thing is that uh, the sequ sequentiality of, of, of operations of fibers is uh, semantic on the application level. You can compose those blocks. Whereas uh, for threads uh, in Java, you end up having the, you gluing your code with a semicolon, and that's it. There's nothing more you can do with that. That's, that's quite profound. And one more thing, um, uh, fibers have built in asynchronous support. It's built into fibers. Uh, which, uh, which gives you superpowers because you can think about computations, about fibers, IOs, and you do actually don't care if the uh, computation you, you're about to run is uh, asynchronous or an asynchronous one. Okay, so fibers are nice. How do you run them? Uh, you run them in an IO app. There, are, there is a bunch of bullet points here for posterity uh, because it is not so obvious what the IO app is actually doing, and there are many questions recurring. Uh, why, why should I use an IO app? Uh, so uh, I'll leave you with just two, two green things. Uh, that's the reason good enough. Uh, it makes the, your application faster because it does some under uh, the hood optimizations, and it adds some nice uh, benefits to your application, like you get automatic starvation checking. Uh, in Cat's Effect, it's that's a recent addition, and fiber dumps, which is also a recent addition. Okay, this you probably uh, very well know, but just sort of as a reminder, fibers are pretty low level, so that's an example. We have uh, two IOs, one is uh, never completes, and the second one uh, throws an exception. And if we use fiber start and, and join to run those in concurrently, we have a problem, because we do end up with the uh, um, with a proper uh, left uh, failed, ex uh, failed uh, fiber, uh, but the IO never fiber actually is never canceled, and, it, and, it's, and it's a leaking fiber. A proper way to do it is to run the high level, use the high level combinators that we already uh, saw, uh, like uh, race pair to get, uh, today. Uh, this will nicely uh, run those in parallel and will uh, cancel the. Um, Mm, the failed fibers. So what's the difference between those two approaches? We also saw that uh, yesterday during Adam's talks. It's called structured concurrency. Uh, it gives you, in my opinion, like IO gives you some superpowers. Structured concurrency is also a pretty uh, profound uh, concept uh, because you can uh, reason statically about the code You can uh, just by looking at the code. Um, you need no complicated logic uh, to keep track of all the fibers um, and have to remember to manually shut them down. Uh, so, um, Cat's Effect encourages uh, structural concurrency, and there are many tools for that, many high level combinators. That said, uh, it does not prevent you from using the low level start uh, or ref. Uh, it's then up to you. You're on your own. Uh, a quick review of some examples of structurally concurrent code. 
so here we've got uh, an effect which raises uh, two effects. It uh, returns the winner and cancels the loser. And as you see, uh, the IO never has been nicely canceled. Uh, here we've got an example where we um, concurrently exe uh, execute all the effects in a sequence. Uh, we, we collect the results uh, and we uh, cancel the rest. We end up with an error if any of those fails and we cancel all the things that uh, if they went wrong. So here we've got a list of two and uh, I will never is cancelled because the because that's the contract. Okay, that's very nice, but uh, sometimes this is not enough. Uh, racing two fibers, sometimes it is not enough, and sometimes all those combinators are not sufficient. And that's the, the playground for the supervisor, which basically uh, adds an extra layer of management for your fibers. So you can start a fiber in a fire and forget manner, and you can be sure that uh, it's going to be taken care of. It's going to be cancelled. It's not going to leak. That's that's supervisor in, in the nutshell. So uh, you can think about it. I can, I can. If I supervise a fiber, I can complete the task without actually, regardless of the outcome of the of the spawn task. Uh, the API is pretty uh, straightforward. It looks very similar to to fiber start actually. Almost the signature is, I think, even the same. So you supervise a fiber, and you get a handle to the running fiber back. Uh, supervisor comes in two flavors. Uh, if you create a scope where you would like to supervise the fibers, you can either say, OK, I'm gonna, I would like to await until all the fibers I have supervised will complete. So if I spawn a fiber which never completes, that's going to uh, the supervisor will also never complete. Or the second uh, um, option is that once I exit the supervisor scope, uh, all the fibers that I have supervised will be automatically cancelled. So let's look how it works. Um, here's an uh, IO which prints forever characters indefinitely. Here we create a supervisor scope uh, saying that uh, we won't await until the, um, all the fibers have finished. Uh, we spawn, we supervise two fibers, which is gonna, uh, both of which will, will do print, print random characters. Um, then we supervise a third fiber, which is a failed effect. Uh, we discard the handle to that fiber, which we, we, we don't care. That's also doable. Uh, we then sleep for uh, 100 milliseconds, and that's the result. So as you see, the two fibers uh, have been printing their characters for, for some time, and after 100 milliseconds have passed, uh, they have been automatically cancelled. Uh, as for supervisor which waits for the results, uh, we define a background task which uh, mm, sleeps for 100 milliseconds, and that's it. Uh, we create a supervisor scope, which this time will await until the uh, fibers have finished. Um, and when we run to background tasks, uh, you see that uh, they have been started, uh, they have finished, uh, and only after have they been finished uh, is the supervisor finalized. So this is the await. Okay. Uh, how can we use supervisor to solve our first problem, the WebSocket problem? Uh, as a reminder, here's our API. We have one, meso one, one method to implement. So here we define a, an I.O. which consumes a queue and uh, feeds its contents into an FS stream. We already saw that together. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty recurring uh, pattern. Uh, we could use uh, something else for the queue. We could use uh, FS uh, channel from FS2 concurrent. Uh, but in principle, uh, we create a, an FS stream from that queue, and we run it indefinitely for effects. That's a simulation of our live WebSocket connection. Uh, then we define our WebSocket client as a resource, because we want to have a scoped resource. Uh, we 
create a WebSocket client uh, which is defined in the way that the send message is actually q.offer. That's, that's the very definition. And then what happens, that's, that's the important part, we uh, create a supervisor. By the way, all of this is, is a resource, so, uh, so that's a for comprehension with resources, not with IOs. We uh, create a supervisor resource, and then we use that supervisor to start uh, um, the consumer in the background. And that's it. Here's how you, how you use it. You've got a WebSocket client, you open the scope, you have the client, you can send the message, you sleep for some time, and you exit the scope. And the message uh, has been printed by, by the consumer, uh, and um, the consumer has been, um, has been canceled. Uh, okay, let's move to the second task. It was about callback uh, APIs. Uh, translating FS2 stream from getting FS2 stream from, from a callback-based API. Um, so that's, that's our method that we are to implement. And quite similarly, we, have an, uh, st we build a stream from a, from a queue, but this time we define a callback in the way that it actually runs queue.offer from, from within the callback itself. We call the unsafe run sync. And uh, that's the example how it works. We um, invoke two callbacks. Uh, we run the effect, we run the stream for effects, take the two elements, uh, and it works. We get hello scala as we, as we wanted to. But there is one big but. Uh, the, the red highlighted code, we actually called unsafe run sync there. And we've been told over and over, uh, do not call unsafe run sync and, and by no means. Uh, why? Uh, we have a solution to that um, and some rationale why why we need that. So mm, a dispatcher allows us to ru to um, to run effectful code from within an unsafe code. So basically, it gives in a wrapper for unsafe run sync. Um, this is part of the interface. We've got unsafe run sync, which is uh, which will um, execute the the I/O and await the result, and a fire and forget uh, variant where we uh, unsafe uh, run and forget. It does come in two uh, flavors: a parallel one and a sequential one. A parallel one doesn't gives you no guarantees about the sequentiality ordering of the elements that you submit. And the sequential one gives you those ordering guarantees. So the uh, constructors are, uh, look like this, parallel sequential, with an additional await parameter. Let's look how it works. Um, we create a parallel dispatcher that uh, will not preserve the ordering of the submitted uh, eff effects. Uh, we have the two effects, uh, sorry, and uh, we see that the first one was submitted earlier, but it was actually executed later because it was delayed, so we get hello scholar. Uh, an example for a sequential dispatcher, we have a strict ordering guarantee this time, so uh, despite the fact that the first effect is, is delayed by five milliseconds, it's gonna print correctly, um, mm, it's gonna print correctly um, scholar uh, to a 2023 hello, so in another way around. Uh, and uh, mm, the highlighted line tells us that the, the, the dispatcher uh, scope will be actually exited after uh, 10 milliseconds. That's why the third I.O. is actually cancelled. So, when to use which? How, how do they to compare? That's a, that's a comparison. Uh, you don't need to ingest all of that. Uh, I, mm, it took me some time to actually gather those pieces of information that are not so obvious from the documentation. So uh, I will leave you only with that, that in general, where you have typical use case, like you want to wrap some uh, callback, like, uh, like we had uh, in, you, you want to wrap a queue offer, just use the, the sequential uh, uh, dispatcher. It's faster and uh, it g gives you the ordering guarantee. Uh, and why is it better than unsafe run? Also, quite a list of bullet points. 
two uh, most important ones. It is much safer because a dispatcher under the hood supervises uh, the spawn tasks using a supervisor that we already know. So you have full control uh, what happens with, with, with uh, submitted fibers, unlike uh, um, in the other case. And it is more efficient because it actually uh, plugs in into the existing runtime. And that's uh, yet another reason from uh, Cat's Effect Discord channel. Okay, so uh, let's revisit our FS2 stream uh, example. And uh, that's the only change in the code, actually. So instead of running on save run sync, we do the uh, on the color thread and await uh, until this uh, is ready on the color thread. Color thread will just do nothing uh, because the actual fiber will run uh, on um, Cat's Effect Compute Pool. Uh, we hand over uh, this uh, execution to the dispatcher, which is hooked to an existing runtime. Uh, we use a sequential one, so we will have an ordering guarantee. We, we can use unsync uh, run and forget. So we will immediately gain back, regain back the, th the, the color thread. And that's it. That's a whole, that's a whole change. Uh, OK, let's move to the third one, contextual logging. Uh, to make implementation concrete, I will fix on uh, Scala logging, which uh, does contextual logging using a pretty straightforward uh, principle. Uh, uh, you pass an implicit context with a logger. Uh, so there is a log message uh, with a context. Uh, there is a constructor which um, taking implicit, which creates a logger taking implicit context uh, um, logger that knows how to log given a um, mm, kernel capability. So how do we use that? Uh, let's say we define our logging contents as a key value uh, set of key value pairs. Here it is our kernel capability for the logging contents, and it works. We define a logger, which takes an implicit. Uh, we do some logging, and we get the key one equals v1 in the log files. Now, if you want to uh, reuse the same technique for the fiber-based code, uh, we need some construct that will bind uh, the context uh, locally to a fiber and will automatically propagate this context across the forking fibers. And that's what IO local is about. It's basically a fiber version of uh, thread local. Uh, the interface is, is pretty straightforward. You could get set, get and set, modify, update, like, like Cat's Effect Ref, basically. Uh, but the semantics is quite different. So uh, the operations that you do with iLocal on, on one thread are obviously visible to that thread. Um, if you fork a thread and update the iLocal, the changes will be only visible to a fork thread and not visible to the parent. And also, if the parent updates the IO local, this change will also not be visible um, to, the, to the fork threads. OK, so quickly trying to plug it in into our uh, logging, uh, lift it into IO. Uh, for keeping the context, we use the IO local. Here is some glue code that will actually allow us to create a scoped context for, for logging. Uh, and that's the example. So we create a logging context. We add a one key uh, value pair to that. And then inside, we spawn three fibers concurrently. Each of those fibers will put a unique correlation ID to the IO local, and it will log the, uh, do the logging. And after we have uh, exited this 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 um, upper scope, we will also do some logging, and that's the result. Uh, as you see, the three fork fibers have inherited the key one v one value pair. They've got the separate correlation ID each of those, and once we have exited, uh, the context is empty, and it's empty despite the fact that it's actually on the same uh, fiber uh, IO compute one compared to the first one. OK, uh, that wraps the talk. Uh, if um, 
there are any takeaways for you from that talk, I would like to be the, the following, that you, that you actually understand supervisor, dispatcher, and, and, and IO local, what is this? Uh, uh, know what, the, what they are and how you can use them. And uh, in, if you want to do some, some, some tweaking, have some reference points uh, for all possible flavors of that. Uh, that's the acknowledgement. Thank you for, for the help. Uh, slides are available uh, on GitHub. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Camille. I'm going to allow one question. So if there is one question, let's do it. Uh, hey, uh, when you fork fibers and then you join, uh, are the context changes that were uh, added inside the forked uh, you, you, you are mean dropped or not? You mean, uh, uh, that's a very good question. You, you're talking about the context, uh, the about uh, IO local? Yes. So that's uh, a very good question. That's quite a deep rabbit hole. Uh, there is a principal difference between a IO local and uh, I think fiber, fiber local in Zio. Uh, the fork joint semantics is different. And uh, to be honest, um, the CATS effect designers had some good reasons uh, to stick with, uh, with the implementation that the, the joint semantics is the following that uh, the fork fibers do not propagate back to the parent. It has some, some good and bad sides, but that's, that's the state of the, of, the, of the matters, as opposed to Zio, where a, uh, if you join a fiber, you, uh, you, um, the context is propagated back to the parent. <laughs>